On today's episode of the Unknown Side of Yu-Gi-Oh, we're going to be concluding the story of the Fallen of Alabats. To recap what's happened so far, in the continent called the Isolated Lands, long dormant plans have finally come to fruition. The head of the religious nation of Dogmatica, Dogmatica Maximus, has taken control of their people, and followers using his stigmata to turn them into despians. Now, under his new despian title, the dramaturge is working with a luber, a mysterious theatrical individual who's enjoying the grand theme play and the chaos that is afoot. On the other hand, there are our heroes and their allies. The heroes of her story, the incredible Ecclesia the Virtuous, who once served Dogmatica but left the nation before its corruption. And there's Fallen of Albaz, who mysteriously appeared one day, falling from a hole in the sky, and has powers to transform into a variety of different dragons. But the two weren't alone. They also have their allies. There's the Tri Brigades, who are a tribe of beast, winged beast, and beast warriors. There's the Spriggans, who are mechanized pirates who live in the Great Desert. There's the Therions, that are otherworldly technological masterminds who love combat. And last but not least, there's the Golden Sword Soul and the Iris Sword Soul, who were like Ecclesia, once members of the Dogmatic Army, but then left the cult before they could be turned evil. Our story ended with Kit enlisting the aid of the Sprites and Therions through combat, while Ecclesia and Albaz are traveling the Mount Sword Soul to help seal Ecclesia's stigmata. And while it seems like the two are starting to have the solution to the Despian problem, the Despians have sinister plans of their own. The Sword Soul clan has a clear hierarchy, with the Supreme Sovereign as the head honcho, and almost all the Sword Soul clan members are fine with this hierarchy, except one, the Sword Soul strategist Long Young, who desires more power and complete domination over the clan. Now, the Sword Souls each have a distinct sword that are projections of their heart and soul, which is why there is such emphasis on their swords. Uniquely, Long Yong had two blades as his malice would be visible to all if he had it out. So Long Yong had his other blade of malice and ill intentions that he hid away from the others so he wouldn't be caught. And before Ecclesia and Albaz arrive, Ad Libitum of Despia approaches Long Yong with an offer for the power he so desires. The power to rule the Sword Soul clan. And so a deal is made between the two in secret. Just as the deal is made, Long Yong had been summoned back as there are new visitors entering the Sacred Sword Soul Summit, which of course are Ecclesia and Albaz. Now, sitting in front of an audience with the Sovereign himself, Cheng Ying, they were judged before Sword Soul Auspice Chung Jun to see if their hearts were pure. After finding out they were both innocent and good-hearted, they were guided to the Ice Jade Sinodanian Cradle to meet Ice Jade Cosmokar. After talking with both Cheng Ying and Cosmoklar, they agreed to help as much as they can. And so the three move into the Endian Cradle to suppress both Albaz and Ecclesia's stigmatas. While the group are in the cradle, Mount Sword Soul had some unwanted visitors. After alerting the whereabouts of the Sacred Mountain, the Despians launch an attack. Long Yong enters the Ice Jade Cradle with both his blades, the one filled with his determination and the other filled with hatred and spite. And now, with the power of the Despians, he transforms into his true form. Sword Soul's sinister sovereign, Kuizing Long Yong. With his new form, he launches an attack towards Cosmokar, but is interrupted by Cheng Ying and the two duel. Until Ice Jade's Cosmokar aids Long Yong and creates King Fisher to help. As the battle rages between the two, a new foe enters the battle. A Luber joins the arena, and he shows everybody why he's a threat. He restrains Albaz using his power over the holes and steals some of his powers, and with it, a Luber transforms into Lubelia. Now with Albaz's power, a Luber attacks Cosmokar and Cheng Ying and deals a massive blow to both of them. As a last resort, they both channel the last of their energies and souls into Albaz, transforming him into the iconic Mirror Jade the Ice Blade Dragon. To take a small break to talk about the cards in the game itself, Let's talk about Mirror Jade, who is a level 8 dragon fusion monster with 3000 attack that requires Fallen of Albaz and one extract monster as its materials. Mirror Jade has the effect that as a quick effect, you can banish one monster on the field by sending a fusion monster from your extract to the graveyard that requires Fallen of Albaz's material. The other effect, and why Mirror Jade sees a ton of play, is that if this fusion summon card leaves the field by an opponent's card, you can destroy all monsters your opponent controls during the end phase. Branded decks ran at least one copy of it as it's one of the best cards to end your board on as the floating effect of its removal on top of its really good quick effect are very serious threats. But now, back to the story. So now with the power of both the Sword Souls and Ice Jades, Albaz is as strong as ever to take on Aluber and Quingzine. Unfortunately, Cosmokar's power has been spent, and her life force starts to fade away as she has one less heartful conversation with Agarine, who was like a daughter to her. And in her sorrow and anger, Agarine creates Ice Jade Agarachasis to help fight to defeat the traitorous Quingzine. And the creation helps as both Agarit Chasis and Albaz down Queensing Long Yong and crash a portion of the cradle into Long Yong and putting him out of commission. Albaz now sets his sights on Aluber, and as they fight, Aluber starts to create a barrier around them. And as the barrier forms, Ad Libitum of Daspia shows up in a portal to invite the others to watch their friends fall. And so they enter to help their friends. Meanwhile, the intense fight between Aluber and Albaz continues. But the barrier in which they are fighting isn't for the protection of the Indian Cradle, it's a trap. The barrier is meant to fuse the two together. And so he begins to fuse both him and Albaz together to create Alba Letitus the Abyss Dragon, and all hope is lost for Albaz. 
While the chaos ensues at Mount Sorsal, Flirtless, Aiden, and Theo head to the Dogmatica capital to stop Maximus, but it seems they've fallen right into their hands, and are surrounded on all sides. So there's no other option, and the three engage, now fighting under the Righteous Banner. The group is separated as Flirtless chases down Maximus, but Flirtless plays right into Maximus' hands as she easily gets overpowered. And Maximus feeds her soul to the Prescanian. And the timing couldn't be worse, as Flirtless' soul leaves her body, Ecclesia arrives to witness the end of her sister's life. Too late to save one of her closest friends. But now Maximus' ritual is complete and he starts to channel the power of all the souls he's taken. Now with the Luber and Albaz fusing into one ultimate dragon, within there has been a fight of who stays in control of the dragon. The fight is pretty hopeless as Luber has full control over his powers. But Albaz hasn't given up, and he strikes the core of Alba Lenitus and breaks free of Luber's grasp and is expelled out of the dragon. And he even still holds a fragment of Mirror Jade, his very own Ice Jade. After the separation, Albaz retreats while Luber has some other issues to deal with. As Albaz shattering the core of Alba Lenitus, it released some other draconic beings that were inside Albaz that Aluber had stolen when they were merged, the Bestial Monsters. The Bestial Monsters are an archetype of level 6 and higher dark and light dragon monsters that can special summon themselves from the hand by banishing a light or dark monster from either graveyard. They each have the unique effects that range from searching for a dragon monster to add to your hand to sending a special summon monster your opponent controls to the graveyard. The most iconic of the bestial cards is Magma Hut, which has the secondary searching ability. Its popularity is widespread as it can search any dragon type monster when special summoned, so it synergizes with a wide variety of decks and acts as another version of DD Crow, which works well against meta threats like tier limits. And you might be asking the relation between the branded cards and the bestial ones, so let me explain. The bestial monsters all have discrete but significant links to all of Albaz's forms. Druiswarm shares the same body shape as Albion, Magma Hut shares a similar build as Masquerade in terms of both color palette and horns, Serenir has the same strong muscular build as Brie Grant. Last but not least, there's Lubelion, who doesn't quite have an Albaz counterpart, but is just the strongest form of a Luber. In her state of sheer despair after losing her sister, Ecclesia gives in. In her grief, Ecclesia dons a new red dress, becoming blazing Cartesia the Virtuous. And now, the stage is finally set and the characters have their new roles in the grand finale of the playwright of the Albaz. Although the odds are stacked against them, Albaz isn't alone. With the friends he's made at the start of his journey, the Tri-Brigade, he doesn't have to face the Despians by himself. And as Albaz and the Tri-Brigades wait for the Despians to make their move, they hear fireworks in the distance. Making quite the scene on their arrival is none other than Kit atop the Exablower, and she wasn't alone either. She was accompanied, of course, by the Spriggans, but with a much upgraded champion of the Therion Arena. Upon their arrival, Kit runs to her dear friend Shirag and gives him a much needed firepower upgrade with the Bucephalus 2 armor. But this means nothing to Aluber. He only sees the ones standing in front of them as ants that need to be crushed. And so Aluber, using the powers of holes, taking the corpses of both the defeated Supreme Sovereign Serpent of Golgonda and the traitorous Queezing, and combines them to show just how powerless Albaz and his puty friends truly are. Emerging from a hole that Aluber created was the Abyss Dragon Sword Soul, only fueled by vengeance towards the ones who took everything from him, Albaz. And so the Sword Soul Dragon locked eyes and attacked. Aluber transforms into Lubion once more, and also emerging from the once nation capital that was known as Dogmatica was a girl, pale as snow in a red dress. And she wasn't alone. She was accompanied by a dragon made of brass and the wings of stained glass. With Ecclesia being nowhere to be seen, Albaz's anger and worry grew. With these feelings and the help of Mercurier, he channels his draconic powers to transform, using Sprint as an almost template for his transformation, but much stronger as this time he has the support of Kit and her machines. Albaz becomes a mechanized dragon, Rindbrum the striking dragon, and so the two dragons clash. Their battle is fierce, but is swiftly interrupted by a wall of ice separating the two. The same type of ice found at Mount Swordsoul, the same ice as the Ice Jades. Ice Jade Grimir Argonine arrives to the battle, but now with the combined powers of all the other Ice Jades. Accompanying the Queen of the Ice Jades was her very own creation, Ice Jade Creation Argeocasis. With Long Yong's betrayal of the Sword Soul clan, he specifically stabbed Sword Soul Amoye in the back and left her to die. And as a Luber took the Great Sea Serpent and Long Yong and melded them together, Agarine did the same with Moye and Agriocasis, which you can see with the Head of the Beast. Furious to see that he couldn't finish his original goal, the Sword Soul Abyss Dragon changed his focus to his unfinished business. And so Albaz, Shirag, Sargas, and Kit had to find Ecclesia while the two sworn to protect each other fight. But standing in the way is Bistiel Alba Loss, a combination of Despian Proskenion and Lubelion, who sees them coming from a mile away and prepares to blast them in one fell swoop. Sargas raised his arms and unleashed a barrage of missiles and lightning. This devastating attack shatters Albalos and destroys the symbol of the Dogmatica Nation. 
As a Luber falls, he heads right into the main hall of the theater of the Brandon. Albaz tries to chase a Luber as he falls, firing Rimbrum's many weapons, trying to hit him as he descends, but his blasts miss their mark. And once he gets a clear shot, the blast is interrupted. Taking the blows directed at a Bluber was Grand Gugnol the Dust Dragon and its rider, Blazing Cartesia the Virtuous. And only now, with Cartesia being so close, does he recognize what truly is going on. Albaz just struck down his best and only friend, who's been corrupted by grief and heartache. Leaping out of Ring Brum, Albaz chases after the following Cartesia, trying to wake her up and bring her back. As the two fall towards Aluber, Albaz's hope is fading. Was there anything that could save Ecclesia from her grief? Not only has Albaz lost his closest friend, but the ritual has been completed. But that's not all. There was one hope left. In Albaz's hand, there was the last fragment of Mirjade carrying the hopes, dreams, and souls of Albaz, Chang Ying and Klaus Volkor. Using the power residing inside the dagger, he placed it in his dear friend's hands as they fell. Albaz channeled all the hopes and dreams of everyone they've met along their journey and prayed to whatever gods there were that a miracle would happen. And that prayer was answered. Ecclesia woke up. In the past, hearing Ecclesia call out to Albaz had reclaimed him, but hearing Ecclesia say with such joy and hope awoke something in Albaz. Empowered by what could only be called as love and hope, Albaz transformed one more. Soaring to new heights and ready to fight off the Dogmatica and Despian threats, Albion, the incandescent dragon, enters the fray. But as Albion soars, Gragugnol falls. As the massive dragon laid on the ground, pierced by two shots from Ringbrum and its war turned on him, Gragugnol was ready to take its last breath. However, in front of the beast stood Guiding Krem, the Virtuous, or better known as the Corrupted White Relic of Dogmatica. In a cruel twist of fate, both Fleurless's body and Cartesia's blades were left unattended. What was giving life to the dragon was in Cartesia's blade, the sealed stigmata of the most powerful of the Dogmatica saints. Quim would not allow Grand Guggenol's job to be over just yet, and so she broke the seal on Ecclesia's stigmata and drew both Flirtilis and Grand Guggenol in, transforming them into Despian Lulu Lilith. While the fighting rages on, Maximus has all the time in the world to complete his ritual. In the main hall of the Despian Theater, Maximus' masterpiece is almost complete. It just needs its final piece. Maximus himself, and so his final plan comes to fruition. Something emerges from the Despian Theater, a massive fiend composed of dark, corrupted magic, surrounded by halos of holes emerge from the theater. The twisted, warped, and penultimate Brandon ritual that Maximus set out to cast was complete. He achieved his final form. The leader of the Dogmatica, the evil god of the nation, Dogmatica Alba Loa, has risen. But the power of the brand is not so easily controlled. As Alba Loa rose and started to make its way to the battlefield, Maximus was struggling to keep his newly obtained power in check. Fighting in and out of consciousness, Alba Loa began to transform little by little, spewing more tentacles out from different orifices. Screaming in pain, the whole battlefield froze in terror, wondering if this was Maximus or was this something else. Alba Zoa let out one last shriek before what seemed like Maximus' struggle stopped. The transformation took too much of a toll on Maximus, and he had lost himself to the overwhelming power of the brand. Bistil Dispater rose in Alba Zoa's place. Sensing the distinct lack of sanity coming from Dispater, Aluber noticed that Maximus had left his throne open for the taking, his servants and belongings up for grabs. And so Aluber took a tactical retreat, claiming the majority of Maximus' belongings, servants, and more. Heading back into a hole with his newfound treasures, this is the last we hear of Aluber, as he sits back and watches the finale of his grand play unfold. As the epitome of Albaz's strength took on Lulu and Lilith, the two traded blows back and forth. They were dead even in strength. But as they fought, Ecclesia's memories of her sister flooded back into her mind, as she thought that if Albaz's hope could save her from the influence of the Despians, then she could do the same for Fleurless, who had to still be inside Lulu and Lilith. Albion stabbed Lilith in the chest with its horn filled with the power of the Ice Jades and the Sword Souls, and Ecclesia reached through and tried to grasp at what remained of her sister. And another miracle happened that day. Ecclesia found her sister, trapped in the depths, surrounded by the souls of all the other saints that lost their lives in the ritual. Ecclesia reached out, and her love of her sister pulled Flirtless back in command of the shell that is Lulu and Lilith. With a cry of happiness that Flirtless has returned once more to the living world, she raises her blade to the sky and calls down her thunder, striking Despater. Seeing this powerful strike, Shirai, who had been fending off the Despian armor with the rest of the Tri Brigade, understands this is the climax of the fight. Thus, he overclocked his Bucephalus II armor and fired at Despater. And last but not least, Albion channeled all of the power he had left in one final golden blast towards the Fiend. And they did it. The alliance against the Despians. The blast struck down the beast and eviscerated it out of existence. After the dust settled, the fight was truly over. A Luber was nowhere to be found, and the Despians defeated. There were no more threats left on the battlefield, and all rejoiced. Now was the time for celebration and to rebuild. 
But this isn't the end of the story of the boy from the hole in the saint. This is only just the beginning of their adventure. There are so many questions left unanswered, like what happened to a luber? What are the holes really? But that's for a later time. Ecclesia and Albaz need some time to relax and go on a much less world-ending adventure together, so they take off into the boundless open land for new adventures and tales to share with all their friends. And that's the story of Albaz. It's quite the long story expanding over multiple TCG releases. If you like this kind of stuff, let us know down in the comments below.